speaking as you are able for the reading of God's holy word. We'll be in Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, he was eating with them. He gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid them from their sight. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, most of you know the story well. After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to his disciples over a 40-day period of time before his ascension. His ascension, of course, is what we celebrate today. And during this time, he taught them about the kingdom of God. And then today we come upon this, his final instruction to them. In verses 4 and 5, he says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, in doing this, he gives them both a promise and a purpose. He gives them a promise when he says, you will receive power of the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then the purpose. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, something that's important for us to recognize here is that Jesus no longer calls them his disciples. Because you see, disciples are those who are primarily students. They are, he says, to be his witnesses. A witness does what? A witness testifies to what they saw. A witness testifies to what they've heard. A witness testifies to what they know to be true. The disciple's job description has changed. They are no longer just students, they are to be witnesses, that is, they are to be apostles. Apostles are those who are sent out to teach others. Some people, some people prefer to remain disciples. Some people prefer to remain students their whole life, have you noticed? There are some people who prefer to be professional students. They, you hear about them all the time. They don't ever want to graduate college. They don't want to leave because they don't want to get out and face the real world. They prefer to spend their time learning and not engaging, if you will, with the world. I wonder if there's anyone in this room and in this, in this holy sanctuary, in this place of worship, I wonder if there's anyone here today who can relate to this. It's easier to spend our time attending various Bible studies and and going to church conferences even than it is to go out into the world and to apply what we learn when we gather together to worship and to study. See, really, something that we all need to be reminded of today is that Jesus didn't really give those who followed him an option, did he? He didn't really give them an option They were disciples as long as he was on earth and in the flesh. But he was leaving them. So now it was time for them to live out their faith by taking what he taught them outside to the world. It's not enough to simply be a Christian one hour, one day a week, is it? 
It's not enough to simply be a follower of Christ and being a part of the family of faith for an hour or a couple hours a week. It means more than that. It's not enough to just simply take up space in a place of worship. It's not enough even to give our tithe or our offering. It's not enough to participate in Bible studies. It's not enough to be in the fellowship. All these things are an important part of our faith and experience of our belief as Christians. But Jesus calls each and every one of him, each and every one who would call upon the name of Jesus and declare him to be their Savior and their Lord. He calls us outside our places of comfort. And he calls us into ways of service. And however it is that he has gifted or graced you, and whatever he has given you, he calls you to use your natural talents and abilities and your gifts and your characteristics. He calls you to use these things in his service. And you see, Jesus knew this was going to be hard. He knew it would be hard for us. He knew it was going to be hard for his disciples. And this is why he promised to them that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. That they were not going to have to do this under their own power. That they would have the Holy Spirit working with them. And this is why Luke reminds us in verses 4 and 5 on one occasion while he was eating with them. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem. Why were they not to leave to Jerusalem? But wait for the gift that my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about for John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. He's preparing them for the Pentecost, which is to come in 10 days. Remember that when the Holy Spirit comes, the disciples would be given all that they need to be effective witnesses to the ends of the earth. Unfortunately, today, it seems like many Christians have lost this compulsion to be this kind of faithful follower of Christ. You know, a few years ago, Dr. Wynn did a survey of a thousand congregations and some of the problems that we see in the church today might be answered with what we see that the survey found. Because the answers that he received could probably help us to better understand what we're dealing with. Because he asked both pastors and members of the congregations what they thought that their church's primary responsibility really was. Dr. Wynn reports that 89% of the people in those churches said that the purpose of the church was to take care of its members. Only 11% said that the purpose of the church was to reach the world with the gospel. Now contrast that with the pastors. He found that 90% of the pastors said that the purpose of the church was to reach the world for the gospel, while only 10% of the pastors agreed with the majority, the vast majority of the laity, which was the purpose of the church is to take care of the needs of its own members. <laughs> is it any wonder why we see conflict happening in churches everywhere today? Is it any wonder why we see some churches that grow increasingly dysfunctional and ineffective because in this passage today Jesus is preparing his disciples for the coming of Pentecost and when the Holy Spirit comes these disciples were going to be given everything they needed to be effective witnesses for Jesus and to the ends of the earth and after he gives them this in final instruction we are told that he is taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hides them, hides him from their sight. And Luke tells us that these disciples, who are now apostles, were looking intently into the sky to see where he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And they say in verses 10 and 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. 
You see, this is something that we know. We know that when Christ's work on earth was completed, he ascended to be with the Father. And at the end of the day, and at the end of history, he will return again, and he will reign over it all. But on this ascension day, we realize that for these disciples, this first experience of they had Jesus back after the resurrection, he came and he witnessed, and for 40 days, they, they got to be in his presence here and there. He would show up and be with them, and then suddenly he comes and he gives them this last final instruction, and then he ascends up into heaven, and they're without him, his physical presence again. This must have been a difficult moment for them, because you see, Christ had opened up their eyes to things that they had never dreamed of. He had opened up their eyes to things that they had never dreamed possible. Can you see? Can you see Jesus in the wilderness each time he is tempted to claim power and glory on earth? Each time he's tempted by the devil himself and he calls upon the very word of God, the word of the Torah. Can you see Jesus as he's walking on the wrong side of the street with the wrong kinds of people? And you see Jesus walking up to that sycamore tree and looking up into it and seeing Zacchaeus perched out on that branch. And he says, Zacchaeus, come on down from there. We're going to dine at your house tonight. Can you see that? Can, can, can you hear him speak those words? Can you see him weeping at the tomb of Lazarus and then speaking a powerful word in that dead body of Lazarus? being raised from the dead and coming back to life. Can you see him challenging that mob as he says to them, as they were getting ready to stone this woman to death, and he says to them, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Hmm. Can you see him casting demons out of the afflicted and healing the infirmed? Can you see him walking on water? Can you see him walking and then riding into Jerusalem? Can you see him stumbling, carrying that heavy wooden cross all the way to the place of death and loving us to the end? And can you see him rising from the dead and coming out of that tomb of death? Ha, ah, what a glorious Savior! we had and the disciples had witnessed all of this they'd seen all of this and more but still they must have felt inadequate for the task that he had given them and what did he mean anyway when he tells them that the gift of the holy spirit is going to come upon them what does he mean by that they could only scratch their heads wonder and wait but you see, there are two essential truths about the ascension that we need to understand today. And the first one is this, is that Jesus ascended into heaven when his work on earth was done. Fifty days after he rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit would descend upon the followers and would turn them into the most dynamic, earth-shaking, culture-transforming group of people the world had ever seen. You see, Jesus in the flesh was limited. He could only be in a certain place and at a certain time. He could only preach and teach and encourage and, and equip in one place at one time. He was limited in his humanity and in the flesh. He needed sleep. He needed rest. He hungered. He thirsted, as we heard him say, as he hung upon the cross. But in the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit can occupy all places and at all times. And can work in the heart of every believer. So the disciples were probably saddened temporarily when Jesus departed again, when this ascension happened. But it was necessary in order for him to transcend the limitations that were placed upon the earthly body. The Holy Spirit was sent to take Jesus' place. And unlike Jesus in his earthly form, this Holy Spirit had no limitations. You see, 
This is one of the major differences between Jesus, between Christianity and every other worldly religion. Of course, his resurrection is what sets things apart. It is the greatest difference between our faith and any other. But his ascension is also, I would argue, almost equally important because it allows the Holy Spirit to come and to work amongst us. And allows imperfect people like you and I to be effective witnesses for Christ in the world. Not by our power, but by the power of his spirit. And the second thing that we need to understand, which is important, and we'll spend more time on it next week, obviously, but for those who will later be confirmed and baptized today, And perhaps a few who may be in here who this scripture has opened something within your heart. I want to say this. The the power of the Holy Spirit has been unleashed in the world. And it is by that power that the world will be won. There is nothing that we can do on our own that would suffice. We must depend on and be led by the Spirit of God in all of our doings. We depend on that same Spirit to make the Word of God come alive within us and to inspire us and to reveal God's truths to us. Everything we do must be examined through the lens of Scripture and be influenced by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that in large part this is what's wrong with many, dare I say, too many churches in America today. Because the very sad reality is that in the United States and in Europe, the faith is waning. But as a result... As a result, when people see what's happening in America, when they see what's happening in Europe, uh, they believe that the, the, the Spirit uh, no longer has the power to transform the world. But let me give you some interesting facts that may change your mind about that. And these facts come from a book that Daniel Meyer had written titled, Witness Essentials. In 1900, Korea had no Protestant church. Today, there are more than 7,000 churches in the capital city alone. At the end of the 19th century, the southern portion of Africa was only 3% Christian. Today, 63% of the population is Christian. Membership in the churches in Africa is growing by 34,000 people per day. That's right, you heard that right, per day. 34,000 people per day are coming into the faith in Africa. In India, 14 million of the 140 million members of the so-called untouchable class, the oppressed, the suppressed, and the downtrodden, this class of people, over 14 million of them have come to the faith. More people in the Islamic world have come to Christ in the last 25 years than in the entire history of Christian missions. In Indonesia, a percentage of Christians has now grown so high that the Muslim government will no longer report the statistics. In China, get this, in China, it is estimated that there are now more self-avowed disciples of Jesus than there are members of the Communist Party. Hallelujah. Even, Even the most conservative estimate suggests that China will soon have more Christians in their country than any other country in the world, including the United States of America. Across the planet, followers of Jesus are increasing by more than 80,000 people per day. And there are 510 new churches planted every single day somewhere around the globe. Hallelujah. Tell me the Holy Spirit is not still at work in the world around us. Mm. By the way, This book was written in 2012, and those numbers have not slowed down. The Holy Spirit is at work. The irony is that except in the Middle East, where the Christian faith was born, and in America, where 
we owe our faith to the very founding of our country and in Europe, unfortunately, amongst these three places on earth. Everywhere else, Christianity is expanding every day. From the 12 grew a group of 120 by Ascension Day. A little over a week later on Pentecost, that grew to over 3,000. By the time the last of the 12 died, there was an estimated half a million Christians. That was by the end of the first century. By the end of the second century, that number had increased to almost 10 million. By the end of the third century, all the heathen temples were destroyed or converted into Christian houses of worship. And by the close of the ninth century, there were over 100 million Christians. Today, that number has grown to over a billion believers around the world. None of this growth would have been possible had Christians not been excited about the gospel, sought to uphold the scriptures, and join in with the work of the Holy Spirit. Friends, something amazing is happening. Something unexplainable is happening around our world. More people are coming to Christ than ever before. People are discovering that Jesus really is the way and the truth and the life. This, this is because when Christ's work was done on earth, he ascended into heaven so that the Holy Spirit might come down and reign amongst us. So the Holy Spirit might bear witness into our lives today. And people are bearing witness. Let me ask you, Are you excited about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you excited about what God is doing around the world? Do you want to join in on the work of the Spirit of God? Do you want to be a part of this faith and this our expressing and living out our faith in a way that makes a difference in the world? Oh, church! Church, we have opportunity. We can join in on the work of the Holy Spirit and be a part of what God is doing at work in this world. Oh, I don't know about you. But being just some small part of what God is doing in a global movement is an exciting exciting proposition for me what about you where where can you join in with what God is doing in the world today praise be his holy name let us pray oh Lord our God we thank you so much we're excited Lord about what you are doing in the world around us. Lord, we turn the pages of Scripture and reread the story of ascension, and we're amazed at your power and your glory. We're amazed, Lord, that you loved us enough to be born and minister and die and resurrected, and that you spent these days continuing to witness and teach your disciples so that these 12 could turn into 120, could turn into 3,000, and ultimately over a billion. Lord, you are mighty and you are good. And we are excited, Lord, and we praise you for what you are doing in our lives and in the life of our church. We thank you, Lord, for these children, these youth who will make decision today to become a part of the family of faith. And for those who've made decisions to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Praise your holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's.